Hello, and welcome to the Old Farm Bus Podcast. This is the back of the bus session. What did that one say? <laughs> CIA, <laughs> MI5, FBI. Can we keep all this bit? Come and get me. Yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have it. Hello and welcome to the Old Farm Bus, Back of the Bus Sessions podcast. Today, I'm honestly buzzing. I've got a guy on here that I've wanted for a very long time. He's a very good friend of mine, so I'm going to jump in with Johnny Swinow. Mikey Markham. It's been too long, mate. Have a shake of the hand. Far too long. It's been far too long. I really like you, man. I love you too, man. I'm very into whatever it is the energy you've got. It's a big part of me. This is good. So we're going to discuss that a bit, but today you've come, yes, for a podcast, and we're going to hear about why you were trapped in Egypt and what you were doing all over the world and just a real essence of you, but also you've come to teach some of the young people in our community. Yeah, mum. I'm buzzing for that. So what is that? What are you teaching tonight and what's made you go into that sort of path? I've always been interested in how the mind works and what the mind does when you don't keep reins on it you know like i suppose the mind and the emotions they're all kind of working tandem together and they can be wild horses man and in and in my experience in life my mind and my emotions have run amok and i've noticed the chaos that creates most people are forced into learning certain meditation tech i mean i can't speak for anyone else but myself but what i've noticed about the people i've spoke to most people come to meditation or to even to spirituality because of a crisis because mm. they don't you know they want to learn how to handle their mind or their their heart and their words and you know because there's too much chaos mm. so i probably did it for that i mean i was always into mysticism and meditation and buddhas and all of that stuff so i was age? naturally attracted well as a kid i was always just a bit deep and like felt that there was another world or there was various mm. worlds you know it was very Alice in Wonderland type mind I had and I always felt that there was loads more to reality than the thing I could just see I even felt it in the dreams I'd have and I used to see the essence of trees the energy coming off them and think yeah there's there's a big vibrancy to life everything's alive but there's loads more going off just behind the curtain of reality that my eyes can see I couldn't articulate it then though. <laughs> I just was like whoa everything's mad you know <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have the words for, for for it then. You know. What age would you say you're at that point where you're looking around and feeling this curiosity throughout all of you? Mm. You're not being able to articulate it, but you're just feeling it. That's really, really young. Is that? Yeah, man. Some of my earliest memories. That I mean, I, I mean, obviously, I was just like, pissing and shitting and puking, and <laughs> I, I just needed mummy. But as soon, as soon as my brain had the cognitive ability yeah. to formulate its own sense of identity and to peer out of these eyes into the world, I always remember a real sense of wonder. Mm. Uh, you know, that's always stayed with me and it's been one of my saving graces, you know. And then are you encouraged to explore that and to attempt to articulate and speak about it? Or do you get sneered at and made to feel silly for feeling yeah. existential? It's interesting, man, because I think a lot of people don't speak about that part of themselves for the fear of ridicule and the fear of being judged. Because there's a lot of people in the community I grew up in, uh, you know, people who are into football and cars. And that's cool, man. There's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, I wasn't into cars, but I w I'd probably have a purple one from the 70s if I had to. That's about <laughs> all I had to say to people about it. But when I said something like... <laughs> yes, I'm the same. But just go in. Okay, so I'd be at the pub and it'd be like daytime. I'd just pop in for a couple of pints and I'd be like, right, I'm off to see the sunset. And people would look at me like, fucking gone out. Yeah. Like, sunset? And I'm like, yeah, man. But if somebody stood up and said, right, I'm off to watch Coronation Street, no one would bat an eyelid. Oh, well, I mean, I'm sure there'd be a few people. No, like, that's a gr great point. That's you know, a really interesting it's weird, point. weird, isn't it? That's fucking weird. Yeah, especially because we are spiritual at heart. That's where we've come from. Yeah, like, man. if you look into it, I've recently watching The Ancient Ancestors and so on, a uh, wonderful documentary, and you look at the symbolism and the mysticism and everything that was entrenched in us then. Why and what was the part of this normalisation and this building into Coronation Street being mm. the, the known thing? 
thing it's is a deep being question, tamed. but why have we been tamed? Because we've been tamed and, and domesticated. Uh, since agriculture, things started changing. This goes way back, man. <laughs> Take us, man. I'm ready. <laughs> okay, so agriculture was the first time where we were trying to control the environment. Uh, I guess really, I mean, since the Industrial Revolution, that's when things really went nuts as far as human culture, because suddenly we had industry, everything sped up, we had the division of labor, we had factories and all of that, and that changed everything. But I'm sure before, I mean, there was, a, there was serfdom before that, wasn't there? So before that, there was, a, there was like the kingdom and the king would own anything, and there'd be peasants working the land, you know. And, the, what, and like, you know, many people couldn't read then. Uh, there was a lot of churches, I mean, but they were often used to subdue the peasants as opposed to liberate them. Mm. So the idea of like the institutionalized version of what it means to be spiritual or religious was really uh, just a surface level version of it. Mm. But yeah, but those same things like the church and controlled way. seems to be the case. Yeah, because they were because it was always connected with kings, wasn't it? You know, it's like the King James Bible, or you know, there'd always be the, some like coronation crown, like, like there's some kind of like royal coat of arms in the church itself there's still a lot of churches that have a royal coat of arms in it and it's like it's got really nothing to do with kings has it it's a church mate you know? <laughs> it's supposed to be the house of god you know what i mean so yeah so we've got sort of classism and then we've got yeah. royal uh but then how are we taming people how do you get to this normalization of putting people in their places and being force fed this kind of media. Hmm. Why is that sort of anaesthetized people? I think we lost the ability, not the ability. We didn't, at some point we stopped having rites of passage. We, just, we stopped having rituals. I love that, mate, because that's kind of what we're doing tonight, really, in this fire pit, yeah, the circle, yeah, yeah. these young lads. It's, it's a rite of passage this kind of thing. It, mate. So that, I'm buzzing you on board tonight, mate. Yes, brother. Yeah, we, we can go deep, mate. We can go anywhere you want. <laughs> so yeah so kids like for instance what you're doing it's like yeah man it's like you know we d it's like that transition from from like sort of from like sort of pre-pubescence mm. into the sudden carnage of all the chemical changes of puberty it's quite sort of traumatic so to deal with that you know they would put a kid through some kind of initiation which wasn't pleasant but it strengthened their mental capacity to deal with things you know when you say strengthen not pleasant, their character. What, what sort of well, things have you heard? Some of the things I've heard is like, yeah, they'll get the teenager, I don't know, like 11, 12, whatever. Like the, I'm sure it's different with different tribes. And they send them out to the forest or to the mountain and they've got to spend a few days there and just survive. You know? <laughs> or just stare at a cave wall. Or sometimes they give them drugs, I believe, as well, where mm. they have to have a vision quest, you know, all that mm. stuff where, you know. I'm not sure that I should really have read up about it. I didn't even know we were going to talk about this. So, uh, Mate, I'm fascinated. There's a lot of information out there. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of vision quests and a lot of rites of passage rituals that are extraordinary. And like to a Western mindset that's, that's in this industrial digital age, it might seem hocus pocusy. But it's bloody fascinating, man, because what it does to the psychology is interesting. Mate, well, that's what we never claim to be experts. We're just experts of our own journeys in life. So, whatever we've heard in podcasts, through books, through our own experiences, that's why I do a podcast. It's yes, just to mate. share that. I heard of a, a tribe, and <sighs> the is it the shaman, shamanic fella? Is it he, mid telling this really profound story? He actually strikes the boys and punches them so, to lose the tooth. <laughs> so they've always got that moment that, where they can feel it oh. representing for that moment. It's honestly it's some of the stories, so that they, it's not just grounds them in that moment, but they've got a, a physical feeling throughout their whole life of something yeah. that they needed to remember and reflect to in this rite of passage. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. sound like the best way of knocks doing it. Knocks the kid's tooth that? out. Knocks the tooth out so they can always feel it in their by their tongue right. is a physical form through the whole of their life then yeah. for, for remembrance. I guess <laughs> that is pretty extreme. As you, as you were talking about it, I was like just laughing and thinking about different rites of passage. <laughs> that. We won't be doing that tonight, brother, but <laughs> it was fascinating. <laughs> Mate, <laughs> I don't know, some of them kids deserve a punch in the face. No, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I deserved a punch in the face when I was I, that I age, deserved mate. a kick in the uh, yeah. temple. Bell end. <laughs> fucking hammer in the <laughs> face, mate, when I was a kid. So I can't say shit. <laughs> so, because, mate, I've met you on so many different parts of the journey. Mm. 
this today feels the most collected and sort of you've got a bit of vision, you've got a bit of clarity and calm about you as well as the same Johnny that I know and love. It feels that way. What has took part in that transition and period for you? Because let's, I'm going to be honest, this part, and we were both on it. Yeah. Drugs galore, psychedelic, crazy party. Yeah, it was a party scene, wasn't it? It was fun. It was bloody fun. And I needed it too. Because. That's a rite of passage in a way. It was. It really is. It's it's a modern rite of passage. You can dip in and get out. And and take what you can take away from it. But we were both in there together yeah. having a having a good old dance and sing song. What can you sort of explain or talk about this period in the mm. in between from there to there, what you've been mm. up to and where you've been? Because I missed you. Yeah. Same here. I missed you too, mate. I, there's a lot of cats from the day that uh, I mean that happens, don't you? You have chapters, you have eras, you see a lot of people, and then suddenly you realise I don't see them anymore. Mm. But yeah, there was a moment where I, it was the last time that I would have seen like someone for years, but you don't see yeah. So anyway, I guess I've probably meditated more. Mm. <laughs> which, is, which brought me to probably wanting to teach it. Cause now I've got more experience in it. Really got down with a lot more healthy practices. But then again, having said that, because I knew you in those days, I would often, if not all the time, always see you when I was pissed. Yeah. So you seldom, if ever, saw me sober. Because <laughs> I had lucid moments in that part of my life, but they weren't as often. You know what I mean? And I wasn't as together then, def- definitely not. What, uh, why the meditation? What started to bring that about? I started meditating really it was because of Bruce Lee films <laughs> and kung fu movies. Because I was always like, you know, those old Chinese films from the seventies. It was like some of them were shot in the Shaolin Temple or like shot in, and you know, I'd always be like, ah, that looks amazing, man, to sit there with a Buddha statue and incense burning and <laughs> gongs going off and just sitting there. Like, it looks like them. It's it's like a shamanic thing again. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, so I tried it out just by reading about it in books and stuff like that. But then I met a Zen teacher. I stumbled across a flyer that advertised Zen meditation classes in Derby when I was living in Derby. So that would have been Jibble, my Zen teacher from Matlock Bath. And he ran that twice a week, I believe. So I met Jibble and he was teaching me. So he taught me the formal Zen. It's called Kwan Um Zen. It's a Korean form of Zen. It's very simple. It's nothing like hokusy pokusy. It's nothing. It's not transcendental meditation even. It's just being absolutely 100% present in the moment and watching your thoughts come and go Mm. and not indulging them, but not denying them. And that's easy on paper. But when you try that, it's like, I like the saying, it's simple, but not easy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, mate, yeah. And can you remember, like, the first session you had? Did it feel really impactful and profound and, wow, I need another moment of that? Or did it take a bit of building up to feel that sensation? Yeah. It's, well, it's a mixed bag because I got glimpses. In, so in the first session, I'd sit there and I was thinking, is it just my imagination? It's like, I'm sitting formally in meditation with a real Zen teacher and I got a bit high off that. I was getting these little flashes of a good feeling. But but the Zen method teaches you never to attach to anything. So if you get a flash of the infinite and you get a revelation, just observe it and then just just kind of come back to now sort of thing. Um, but yeah, you get, you get these little intimations, these little flashes. I think the biggest ones were when I was doing it on my own in a forest or on a hilltop mm. and I was surrounded by like nature. You know, because that's a pretty good environment that's conductive to being pretty chill, man. You know what I mean? You've got <laughs> exhaust fumes and music and banging and, you know, stuff like that. And, yeah, you can definitely feel like you're literally dissolving and you're part of everything. Mm. It's like your ego suddenly just fucks off for a few seconds. <laughs> oh. And then you suddenly realise that you're just everything. Yeah. And it's not trippy. It's not like, oh, man, that's so deep and trippy. It's just like... You, you know, it's just you have a sense of connection to everything, mm. which is what a lot of people crave. A lot the of people, source, the where source we're from. man, the source mm. material, yeah, the prima materia. Would you say that is your philosophy then, Zen Buddhism? No, if, you, if no, someone no, no, was no, to no, ask no. you, no, definitely not. I, I wouldn't call myself a Zen Buddhist at all. I'd use the word Zen. I, I was always attracted to the word Zen. I, 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 I like the way it looks on paper, and I like the way it sounds when I say it. 
<laughs> but but I have been formally taught Zen, so so I'm allowed to use it. Of course, perhaps. Uh, but no, I'm I'm into Taoism. I'm into shamanism. I'm into like esoteric Christianity. I'm into mystical Kabbalah. Uh, you know, the kind of mystical Judaism, Kabbalah. Mm. I'm into the Sufis of Islam. Uh, I mean, I say into, I've studied a lot about all of these things. I quite I quite like ritualistic magic, like the Israeli Regardi, Alistair Crowley, some of that stuff's interesting. Uh, yeah. There's so much in that where we can go down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> every single one of them yeah, is yeah. Uh, <laughs> infinite any, rabbit hole. Bro, any you know I mean? mentors that you can reflect to that caught you in a, pivotal moment a powerful moment of your life where you saw that person talking about Taoism mm. or how you were and it again just spoke everything to you in that moment right it's an interesting point one of them would have been probably the biggest one was Alejandro Jodorowsky who's okay. a filmmaker poet playwright uh, he's it's hard to categorize the guy but he's an artist sort of thing and he made a film called The Holy Mountain. You might have heard of it. It's, no, I don't think so. It's a really tripped out psychedelic masterpiece from the early 70s. Is it something I need to watch? You need to watch The Holy Mountain, Mike. Really? If, you ever see, it's, if somebody asks me what films do you recommend, I always think of The Holy Mountain straight away. No, mine's uh, Pleasantville. Have you ever seen that? Have I seen Pleasantville? It rings a bell. Mm, Jerry Maguire and yeah. Reese Witherspoon. No, I haven't seen it. Yeah, no. That's a you film as well. So oh, we'll, do, we'll do a switch off there. Okay. Holy Mountain, Pleasantville. I Gosh. promise to watch Pleasantville if you promise to watch I, The Holy Mountain. It's, Simple, it's another deal. Let's We're do in. it, man. Because, yeah, that film is an initiation itself. Right. And if somebody just wants to watch it for the trips out visuals, you can. I mean, I put it on at parties, man. It's like, I was a real young guy when I discovered, like, Jodorowsky. And I used to take The Holy Mountain around to parties and put it on while everyone was taking bongs and taking drugs. <laughs> and I just put that on in the background and we'd be like watching it people like what the fuck yeah. is this <laughs> I think, uh, this, freak people out is it similar to is it the book of life have you seen that one or I don't think I've seen that uh, again it's all cartoony but he's just this lad going around and meeting different mystics and philosophers it's a bit like that yeah psychics it's about it's like the fool's journey it starts off with this drunk guy in Mexico and, oh, wow. and the drunk guy meets uh, this alchemist in this tower and this alchemist takes this uh, this fucking tumor out of him and then he like initiates him and then he gets all these rich and powerful people and shaves their heads and he fucking takes them to this mountain puts them through hell puts them through this initiation it's full of mad imagery man wow okay yeah. I'm, I'm in it'll so change your it, consciousness it was the director of that where you started going down that quest and that yeah path. very much so I can trace most of it back I, mean, I, can, I can trace it back to Bruce Lee as well because he was my childhood hero <laughs> because I can Bruce Lee theme in here so Bruce Lee like introduced me to Taoism and Buddhism, I suppose, from like getting into Kung Fu films. And then I suddenly just caught a Jodorowsky film randomly because I thought it was a spaghetti Western on BBC Two back in the 90s when we had four channels. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I think show your age. <laughs> Channel 5 was not even around then. I think it was out a year later. Mm. So this was around 96. So I was Magic like, Roundabout for me, Channel 5. That's what Magic I remember. Magic Roundabout, bro. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty... I think that's an initiation as well. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> It'll teach so, you yeah, some things. It was Jodorowsky, man. I can trace most things back to Jodorowsky. And that's Taoism. No, no, no. Sorry, I was sorry, I was kind of going off on a flex then, brother. Uh, so I would kind of mention Bruce Lee. It's like that's where it fundamentally it started with me just just gazing into like the world thinking life's mad and trippy. But the first person I discovered, it probably would have been Bruce Lee, but that was uh, it was a bit it was only really Taoism and Buddhism and the things that Bruce Lee used to say, he used to say things that were very like Alan Watts and mm. a Krishnamurti. And he was a very philosophical man, a very clever bloke, very spiritual guy, Bruce Lee. I think that people miss that aspect of him. They just see him as like this. He's like the founder of MMA. He's the guy that, who was ripped, you know, and who went, wah, and did the films. But he's a deep dude, man. So it's probably Bruce Lee. But then when John Orosky came along and I discovered him, that just blew everything up. And I got into Carl Jung and all sorts of stuff mm. from that. Because well, what is the mindset there to try and summarise it for somebody that hasn't even heard of Taoism and these ways mm. of being? Because for you, a lot of people think of hippy-dippy, woo-woo stuff, and it's peace and love, baby. And then you look at Bruce Lee and he's an absolute ripped-up, warrior, fighting man. warrior yeah, kind man. of guy. So... What is that, that balance in there where you've got the beautiful essence and mindset of life and this strength of character and you're allowed to use all these 
sides of yourself. That's important, Mikey. I think that's a really good point as well because the spirituality, as it's understood by most people, is that it's just airy fairy. Yeah, it? uh, it's like. It's the, it's the kind of spirituality supermarket, the plastic. Yeah. So anyway, Where, where's that come from as well? Just it's just interest. the idea of something come. I think it was the counterculture in the sixties. They suddenly started to bring a lot of arcane things back into mainstream culture, like tarot cards and I get yeah, and like burning incense and wearing robes and suddenly being into Eastern philosophy. And obviously, the there was a market rich for kids buying all this spiritual stuff. So they suddenly it was I was. It's a brand new market open now where we can sell spirituality. Modify as a, stuff. Yeah, you sell it as a spectacle to be consumed as opposed to get to the... I like the way you use the word essence a lot because that's t- that's kind of what I try to get at. Because mm. like behind all of that, there's an essence to everything. But um, yeah, I guess kind of Taoism, all these different practices are all just different methods of searching. Some of them are, I guess... I couldn't call Taoism a religion. That's more of a philosophy. It's like Chinese alchemy. It's a, it's a way of life. It's a way of adapting the mind and flowing with nature and not trying to control anything. It's very similar to Zen. They say that Zen was partially born from Taoism because mm. Zen was started in China in the 5th fifth, fifth century. So this was a long time ago. And like an Indian monk, because uh, Buddhism started in India. Mm. So there was this Indian monk called Bodhidharma who traveled through China and he met loads of Taoist masters. Because Taoism is a Chinese form of spirituality, alchemy, like kind of magic. But kind of Zen got away with all the magic. It kind of sort of, it, it sort of did away with the magic and the, and the kind of stuff and just focused on being fluid with nature, being adaptable. And Bruce Lee spoke about that a lot. He says that, be like water because water can flow and drip and, and creep and drip and crash. You can have a cascading mm. waterfall or you can have, you know, just this sweet shimmering rhythm of a river. You know? mm. but it's all the same. It's all the same essence, isn't it? And it so, can turn into ice. It can turn into steam. It's very adaptable. Yeah. So it's about being fluid and not stagnant because if you stay, it's like the mind itself and the emotions. If you repress your emotions, yeah. There's no fluidity. It's like it's like a little malignant, stuck. Bill Bird does a good a- um, sketch about this about his dad. Just oh yeah, hold it down, hold it down. Yeah, and then yeah. when he learned in the end to sort of feel his emotions, and they all come shooting out at one time. Yeah, this it, is it, brother. But I, I really like that, and I think is there something in in Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, of dukkha? Does that mean suffering? Dukkha means suffering. That's right. So it's the Sanskrit for suffering, which is more to do with unsat. So like kind of people interpret suffering. It's a bit westernized. It's got. A- so what the apparently the Sanskrit term dukkha is more related to the word unsatisfactoriness. Right. Okay. So the idea of you're always craving something else, you're never quite satisfied, which is suffering, I guess. But kind sure. of suffering to, a, I think the suffering kind of comes up to our mind like. I don't know, like someone in a torture chamber. Or, I don't know, you know what I mean? Suffering. And then a sort of a, a way of teaching that. They they have to teach the suffering and then how to live with suffering and then to transcend beyond that to find nirvana. Is that kind of a, yeah. a play, a cycle that they're trying to get you toward? This, yeah, go on. And, and uh, just seeing if that sort of equates in both philosophies where there's a recognition you understand suffering mm. and how it exists but we don't just allow that to exist and not only is the way to live with suffering but there's a, a slight understanding of like enjoying the, the, the whole of it yeah. all of it the suffering's yeah. part of the beauty it's accepting it when it comes along it's like something's visiting you it's like the weather it's a, just a part of nature it's a part of who you are yes and if you offer no resistance to it, but you don't indulge it either, then it just flows through you and then you can just observe the feeling that you're under. Uh, and not identify with it. I think that's the problem with with a lot of uh, strong emotions is, is that we heavily identify with. I mean, because mm. stress isn't pleasant and like sadness is sad, you know, and it's not something you wish for. But when it comes, you know, people uh, d- dwell in it. It's like they marinate in it. Hmm. It reminds yeah. me of a... I went to Bali. I was uh, in Australia for a year. Then I went to go over to Thailand, but we had to stay at Bali for a week or something, me and my mate. 
and it's gone now because all the Australians have ruined it for people, oh, as no. they would. As, as they <laughs> but, do. <laughs> there was this beautiful river where you could go down, and then you'd pull yourself into different bars, and you go down the river, nice. and then you, if you can catch one of the ropes, you go into the bars, and then you if get you a can. drink, and then you keep going. Um, but That's the mental. Australians ended up getting too drunk, and kill, like uh, quite a few ended up dying. So I think they stopped that. I thought about that. I'd probably die if I did. That. Mate, it was it was what you're on a rubber. <laughs> dinghy and you're doing that but i suppose for me it feels like you're on this river and all them bars are like your thoughts or or the pain or the suffering yeah, right yeah, and yeah, for yeah, us yeah. we're looking at them and they look interesting yeah. so you always feel the need to just go towards yeah, them yeah. but Indeed. actually you're drinking poison a lot of the time so instead just going on that river looking by them seeing the fascination and mm. the curiosity of them but Allowing not feeling them to pass. yeah the need to to go and suck into them yeah it's very tempting to indulge anything like that isn't it and yeah yeah i mean a poison like you said that's a good way of putting it because it's like sitting with it's like you know when you're angry it's like i, I mean there's nothing it's like there's certain spiritual practices that say you know no bad vibes love and light only <laughs> here you know and it's like really are you really going to suppress your shadow because you're going to become a really passive aggressive annoying person if you don't acknowledge your shadow you fool mm. it's like that the carl jung yeah there's f- f- mentality there's something Carl Jung said I, a lot of, I lot know, of wise and, things about it, yeah. Yeah, shadow yeah. work, I've always heard from Carl Jung. I think he originated Did he the pioneer term. pioneer that? I mean, I'm sure there was a sh- there was many shamanic practices. In fact, there's a lot of a Tibetan Buddhist practices where they embody a demonic state. Uh, there's a lot of shamanic things. But yeah, sort of the modern version of the shadow is definitely Jungian. Okay. Because he says that everybody's got a shadow and it's where you put all the parts of your personality that you don't want to acknowledge that you say, that's not me, you know. It's like the parts of us that could be potentially, you know, murdersome and mm. rageful and envious and all other things and then what does that do for you by turning toward them shadow work would entail going into the places you don't want to go into in yourself it's like the hero's journey it's like you know going into the cave you know the the dungeon <laughs> where all the demonic entities lie you know the old stories where you know there'd be a hero going into the underworld and mm. they'd, they'd, they'd find a dragon and they'd be sleeping by gold. There's, always, there's loads of stories where there's a dragon guarding treasure. Yeah. And there's, and there's a hero with a sword. And he's like, what the fuck, the dragon? This is <laughs> fucking horrible because it's massive. Uh, but the dragon's just you. It's just your, all the all the parts of you that you're denying is the dragon. So you got to go on. F- not, fighting a dragon might not be the right term. I think you have to absorb it. You have to integrate it. Mm. You have to face all the things about yourself that make you don't want to deal with and make friends with it. And then like integrate it and alchemize it. It's like the idea of alchemy. It's like you can turn dross into gold. You can turn shit into gold. Yeah. We've spoke a bit about this on the podcast. And I know both of us have dabbled. Um, psychedelics. Mm. You even mentioned it in Rites of Passage there a little bit. Mm. What What is your thought on psychedelics and their potential impact on societies, potential impact on people, safely consumed or whatever it is yeah where, where are you at with psychedelics they're great man they're loads of fun aren't they <laughs> interesting <laughs> it's i mean i guess the me- it's I guess it's medicine isn't it mm. you know but like you say safe like a safe controlled environment i don't know man yeah some people need to go out of their minds and have a freak experience as well maybe but uh you know it's only now in in this culture where the scientific community, the mainstream scientific community is starting to look at them more seriously. I do, I do a BBC show on Thursdays and they're yeah. even talking about it on there. there like last go, week on BBC, there you go, mate. we were basically touching the edges and the fringes of psychedelia um, because it was on the BBC website. So Aaron, who runs the show uh, for an hour, was like, right, we're going to talk about magic mushrooms and their potential. And I'm loving seeing this come through. Yeah. I'm, I'm absolutely, I, I think it's completely, Pulsary in at least politics. <laughs> I think they need to have been dosed a little <laughs> bit to, to just be shown humanity and, and shown imagine? that sense of themselves. I truly believe that. I really imagine do. Imagine tripping on Boris Johnson. <laughs> I, just, I just want him to oh, be I terrified. Just peculiar. One. I would like this feeling for him. <laughs> And then he's, he's jumped in for six hours in this He'd whirlpool. get naked and put a nappy on yeah. him and smear himself in his own shit. But I at think. least at but the that, end yeah. of it, he'll be like, uh, too much for me, I'm out. And then yeah. we'll get some other dude. This is it, brother, this is it. Like, or we get through it and find something on the other side. I, I, I truly believe it. And I, was scared of, I, mean, I was scared of psychedelics as a kid because of all the 
propaganda, man. You know? Yeah. It's like at youth club and school, they had, there'd be pamphlets and you'd open them and be like, yeah, this is ecstasy, this is LSD. It was kind of teaching you what they all looked like. Yeah. And there were some kids used to cut out the pictures of LSD and then they'd Stick like kind of colour in the back and they'd, no, they'd sell oh. them. Oh, fair. <laughs> so all these pamphlets that warned you against Mate. drugs, kids were cutting out Profit. the LSD pictures and like, you know, colouring in the back where there's a bit of writing, colouring it in. Yeah, they'd be selling them on the playground. And I bet there's some people that would have taken it and pretended they had the most magical experience. It could have been a placebo effect. Yeah, that's... Because the parasuggestion is so... Yeah. This is something else that comes into certain spiritual practices, you know what I mean? Hypnotherapy kind of stuff. That's that's similar as well. I mean, I guess all of these things are all forms of sticking you in a different mindset Mm. and you're perceiving the world from a different lens than you ordinarily do. So what a psychedelic experience can do, which is really good for some people, is just kick them right out of their their like kind of reality tunnel that they're always in. Mm. Because everything that we perceive every day, uh, it's just it's often learned behaviour, and that can be a good thing because we need certain certain Structure. structural habitual ways yeah. of perceiving the world that help us get on with our jobs and whatever it is that we want to do. But yeah, a good psychedelic experience can throw you out of like your everyday mindset and just show you yourself a bit more you know i like that because we do, we get too invested and stuck in routine and rigid with it yeah, yeah. but when you go to that loot the world what is time you're like tell me when i need to get to work <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <'cause, laughs> yeah that it is an abstract concept and so on but then sometimes you don't want burnt pizza and that this is it, it's brother. helpful to take time and use it set aside a time to have a trip you know what I mean? Don't do it when you got to feed the kids and yeah, yeah, <laughs> do all of those things. You know I couldn't I mean? agree more, man. That's, I, I'm <laughs> interested on that side. Um, a lot of this and a lot of the ways, because I feel we're so similar and got a connection, a commonality. A lot of it for me transcended from being in a lot of pain. Like I hated school. I really didn't fit the system. I've told this story a few times. I'm not telling it again, but there was a pivotal moment for me in school. I ended up getting kicked out, but I had a, an end meeting with a head teacher and my mum was there and it was a full, oh, I don't belong here. Mm. My sister's five years older than me and I basically got told, you're never going to be like her. And it was horrible. You're never going to be like Mate, he looked, well, he looked at that. me, looked at my mum and went, he didn't realise we were related, you see, me and my sister. It's okay. her favourite. It's a great story. It's interesting. Well, basically, um, she's got a different second name. My sister's Mullen Feroz, oh, and I'm Markham. Got you. And Mullen Feroz came from Persia, because my granddad came over here as the doctor and was healing people in a place where EDL, BMP oh, was wow. really ripe. You've got my granddad coming over and changing mentalities, philosophies, and then... But the Markham gene, nobody knows of my <laughs> Birmingham. <laughs> so when this teacher wow. uh, loved my sister because she was very academic, mm. switched on, knew what she wanted, that's what she always tried to keep it a bit separate. Mm. So when the teacher said to my mom, Mrs. Markham, what we're going to do about your boy? She, who is really proud of her heritage, where she's come from, especially her dad, like, mm. I am not a Markham. Wow. I'm a Mullen for Rose. And then he linked it and he went, <laughs> you, you're Beth's mum. <laughs> no, and, and honestly, the moment where he looked at me and looked at me and went, you must be so disappointed in Michael. Oh, like wow. that, that fucked me up, to be honest, man. It was a horrible moment. What was in him to make him? Expressive. Well, he was an ex-Marine. He yeah. was quite militant. He's, and a, he, he's he, a disciplinarian. I, do you know what? Crazy. I was in Ashbourne the other day and I saw him. Wow. Yeah, I'd been thinking of him for a, a completely you... other reason. Okay. It, it'd been in my mind. You conjured him up, Mike. Mate, it was wild. That's manifestation. I, I, it was true grown. manifestation. I think there was something I needed to confront there. Yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. I let it go. <laughs> Good. Um, so you, there was a little itching you'd maybe to go and swat him around the head. I wanted to give him a book or something and just say, did do well, mister, <laughs> you big bully. <laughs> but from that, there, there was a lot of pain there. There was a lot of confusion. Mm. There was potential. I, I was on very suicidal path. Um, and then there's a story of why that didn't come to be. But there was just so much pain from childhood, teenager. I, I, re I had no idea what I wanted to do. And that's where the, the philosophies and the spiritualism and all yeah. these different beliefs come from. Any similarities in you there where you've got my pain and that's struggle? freakily like my experience, mate. Tell me. <laughs> Very much so. So <laughs> uh, I didn't get on in school at all. Uh, I liked 
some of the facilities. I like the library. That was cool. I like drawing and all that. Uh, I had a few good friends there, but uh, nah, I fucking hated it, man. Mm. Uh, and I was also removed from the school in the third year. What'd you do? Just so I didn't do one thing. I did. A, it was just me. It was an accumulation of like you keep it's like this. You know, I was skiving off. I'd, I'd just climb on the roof and just walk on the roof. What would a report read if? Oh, I've got one of my. I'll, I could, if we do a podcast again, I'll bring, bring in my it school in, report. Man, it's fucking br- hilarious, man. So <laughs> it's like you know, John didn't offer an apology for skiving from my lesson, and when I asked him about it, he asked what it had to do with me. Terrible attitude, you know. Yeah, just yeah, all this yeah. lecture. <laughs> uh, it's it's like I, 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 I was a nightmare, man. The social dance, they know how to play it, don't they? they do, da, mate. Da, da, da. Um, so that that was education. Then you get asked to leave. Are you sort of stuck in a point then of I, I don't know what I'm going to do? I had no idea what I was going to do, and I didn't really know. I mean, I had interests that I pursued, but you know, it's not. It didn't fund my, you know, so. Yeah, I was kicked out and I went to a special school for naughty kids in Normington. It's funny that I ended up living there, actually, just around the corner from my old school. And, you know, I'd be there at my special school. It was much nicer because the teachers were there and they understood that the kids that were that were there were kicked out for various reasons. So they were a bit more chill, you know what I mean? But I had no idea what I wanted to do, mate. Mm, so really. how do you discover some passions, though? Because I do feel for young people... Well, all people yeah of course having a hook having a passion having a purpose and what can be seen as a meaningless life mm. is the beauty and the essence of what we're talking about that's part of it Absolutely. so where did you discover mentors and how did you start finding who you were and bits of you mm. i guess it was probably through some of the people that i mentioned like when because I, I was i think i just left school or i was still i think I'm, it's possible i was about 16 when i, I discovered jodorowsky and he led me on to all sorts of mad stuff. Um, really, I just like I just did some really boring jobs for a little bit, and then decided to go to college. Mm. So, so I studied art. I think I was just studying art because I just didn't want to get a job. Mm. So I, I did the college thing, met people, and just spent those few years doing the art course just to get wrecked and pissed and have sex. <laughs> I, I played in a band. Art and course will do that for and you. And I thought I can play in a band, man. You know. I was a kid and I like rock and roll music, I like punk rock and I can form a band and just live in a squat man or something. Wow, you know I, mean? I didn't know you were in a band. I was in a band and I lived in a squat. Punk punk rock in a Yeah, it, it didn't last long. I think we only did two gigs. And a squat. So I don't know if I was in the band at the same time as living at the squat, but it, it did coincide with my mentality at the time. It's like <laughs> I'm the kind of person that's not gonna even rent towers when I live it. Because it was still legal to squat then. Yeah, you could literally squat legally until Cameron's government changed the law. So yeah, I, I, I kind of pissed around playing in bands and yeah, and I didn't know what I was going to do. And then when I left university, I did one year at university, but I was like, I'm not getting in debt here. And I just got odd jobs for a little bit. wasn't really sure what I was doing, to be honest. With the the music, was there ever a moment where you thought we could do this? This could be more than just pissing about. Definitely, yeah. There's some good songs we did, man. But uh, getting all the right people firing from the same cylinder is hard in a band, isn't it? especially when you're a kid mm. and the drummer's a total stoner, <laughs> the singer's half you're schizophrenic. You know, uh, yeah. So everyone's got to be pulling in the same direction. But you know, yeah, yeah. I guess I could. I did. I don't think I have the ambition and the drive to want to do it that much because when I did get a band together and toured and properly did it soon got really repetitive. I was like, I thought I really wanted to do this with my life. And it's just like, I'm just traveling all day to get to a venue. You spend half your time just waiting around, mm. in the band, just waiting around. And then you, you you do a sound check and then you wait around again. <laughs> and then you do a gig for half an hour and then you go home. You know I mean? Yeah. Or sleep with somebody in somebody else's house and you're like, yeah. oh, I've no, done it this is now. It, <laughs> yeah, it's great. <laughs> that, that repetition again. I think I'm just a bit of a mod right. ass or something. I don't know. I just did. I thought. I thought this would be like you know the bee's knees, man. More substance again. I suppose I just probably envisioned it to not be such a repetitive, grueling waiting around and everything. I just wanted to get on stage, play, and just party or go home. You know what I mean? Mm. (laughs) So no, I love it. But I think that's the thing of testing the waters with things and at least trying stuff out, and then realizing you've lost the scent there. Have you watched the film Soul? 
Soul, what, S-O-U-L? Or? S-O-U-L, yeah, it's, um, so. it's a Disney again. Ah. They've been nailing it recently. Gotta catch up with my Disney films. But though. again, it's this guy, I'll ruin it for everyone now, but <laughs> it's this jazz musician, and he ends up dying in the film, and his soul goes off here, and he's trying to get back down to reality. He's in a coma, actually. Hmm. Um, but then he eventually does, and he gets to have that opportunity of the gig, and he realises, oh, it didn't feel any different. And he missed out on all mm, this beauty and this, this dance and this yeah, beauty. All the, this, again, the real stuff on the way because he's just been aiming over here. Yeah. I think there's a, because I love South Park, my two favourite things in the world, South Park, Alan Watts. <laughs> oh, <laughs> They're me. up there together. And they did some little mini series um, where South Park would depict what Alan Watts was saying. And wow. there's about two minute clips, but... In essence, it's as if Soul had watched that and then just created a whole film out of it. It's really interesting. It was really beautiful, man. Wow. But we've got you in this band. Start, so it was being recognised and you were going on tours then. Yeah, yeah. That's did pretty some of cool. That. Yeah, man, it was pretty good, yeah. Awesome. Then you get in this repetition feeling. Mm-hmm. So you're like, we've lost the scent a little bit. I thought it was here. Yeah, It's got to go somewhere else. How do you support yourself and financially be stable you said you mentioned you went into getting a job quote unquote yeah i just had odd jobs i guess throughout a lot of my 20s you know what i mean but uh i think that thing about being you know but not i think i was just looking for something outside of myself to be happy yeah and be satisfied and thinking that a lifestyle like that would satisfy the ever ending itch that i couldn't scratch you know Mm. sort of thing and really what it is, is I just didn't probably know my essence or myself. Or There was just stuff I, ha- I wasn't dealing with. I think that most people do things to distract themselves with, like for what they're not dealing with mm. inside their own soul, spirit, yeah. heart. And so you go into those places uh, and you're okay exactly as you are, then anything that you pursue outside of that, you're just grasping. You know? You're just kind of like clawing for justification or a quick fix. I love that we've got uh, joy, that you know. part of the conversation yeah. though, because yeah, you're you're searching externally through mm. music, then you're like, no, financial, I need to get odd jobs, a job. This is throughout your twenties. Where is it where you start to go inside and you're like, oh, none of this is working. I've tried the creative path. I've tried the making a bit of money path and mm. all that. I need to fix what's in here. Where yeah, does all that yeah. come from then? That would have been slightly later on. You know what I mean? I mean Early 30s. Though having said that, there was like moments in my 20s where I'd have crazy revelations, man. Where I'd mm. like have profound spiritual, if you want to call them that, experiences. Like visions and dreams and all sorts of mad shit, you know. Uh, and I always had a very deep sense of that. But when I really started to to go inward and really learn the essence more was, yeah, that was my 30s more than anything. Mm. Probably, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, where I'd just probably become a little bit mentally sick and like realised that, because I've got, I've got some mental illness on both sides of the family that I've observed in certain family members. I had an uncle who was schizophrenic. Uh, and I've there's patterns on both sides and I've noticed it's like, I have a proclivity towards what some would consider to be maybe madness mm. or psychological illness. Or something, you know. I've been there uh, induced before. For, yeah, and it lasted right. for months. It was horrible. Right, right. Well, you had a lack of psychotic break. Sort of yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, I, I attribute so much of why I'm here to psychedelics. Mm. But I always tell the, the full detailed story is that was brilliant. But then I didn't get ad- addicted to the substance, but just more the feeling that it gave me yeah. and I was chasing this thing and then this answer started coming. I wanted this no, answer, wanted the it, answer, the you? answer. Chased uh, it. And then everybody, it'd be me and, so it'd be me and a mate and then they'd go process it, deal with it, whatever. But then the next night it'd be me and somebody else, wow. me and. I ended up getting tasered on a psychedelic. You told me yeah. very briefly about this it all once. went. It all went wild after that. The, the only re- <laughs> it was love that kind of broke me uh, because and it a toxic love, yeah. Um, but after a, a relationship breakup, first mm. proper love, oh and yeah, that, man. that snapped me in two. That wound you to the core, mate. And I, and I was somebody that's always seek validation, particularly in women, because I've always had mm. a, a lack of that throughout mm. my life. But then it was love that kind of saved me again because I remember I was going to people's houses and I thought they're all trying to poison me 
Well, this is true as ah, well. You got the paranoia. Flex. The paranoia started yeah, coming yeah. through. So I was real careful of everyone I was around. And then I started watching. Do you know films like The Truman Show mm. or Shutter Island? I and started I was like, getting into that man. Wow. This man. honestly, it was on that trajectory and the biggest thing and this is where love fixed me was i went to my grandma's house and now she is the only constant that has provided has been there see me on the worst sickest darkest days Mm. and i was there and i thought she had gone in the room to to put the poison in wow and i was like she's your biggest hero Fuck that. Why did that put it in she, she, uh, Yeah, you? I had yeah. to sit there. I was like, yeah. she wouldn't do that though. She loves me. To, she's done everything for me. Why for this moment? To surmount to this? Yeah, exactly. And then something just hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, fuck that. And I ran out and I was like, you got to sort your shit. So then I did. I took a long wet from partying, from drugs, from yeah. everything. I just went back to the drawing board and said, right, We've got to start afresh from here. Yeah, man. What do we know? <laughs> <laughs> Rewrite the story, dude. And Mate, there's so many that people that from. go down that path and they don't claw themselves back like you did, or they go further than you did. And mm, it takes I've heard to of recall, it. Man. Yeah, it. yeah. I mean, now that's interesting, mate, because it, it, it takes a crisis sometimes to force you yeah. to like really change. It shouldn't take a such a <laughs> cataclysmic event like <laughs> to make people change. But unfortunately, often, often does, you know what I mean? That's the world we live in. I'm glad you clawed back, Mikey. Mate, you know well, I mean? it's wild, isn't it? Because you were around in them times. I was. Like, I think I Molly it. actually mentioned it to me. I don't know if I should mention any names because we're being recorded. But uh, it was at Why Not Festival, I believe. Yeah, that was where that happened. But yeah, also the, the whole breakdown <laughs> and everything, the... The, the psychosis and schizophrenia and all that was yeah. still in a similar time frame. Yeah, and, sure. Uh, around that period. Oh, so, period, yeah, that was sure. Yeah, it's wild, they're dipping in and out. Mm. But you you saying that you've been susceptible Experience. to similar I've experienced and, psychosis before. I never, uh, I mean, I've had a few breakdowns, definitely. Absolutely, I've had a few breakdowns like in my life. Uh, and I always saw them as almost a religious experience, but like some people say that's part of the illness. Mm. Uh, but I found that, you know, it's a funny territory to get into. You know, I tried to stay away from psychi- psychiatrists and the the modern medical community at present, if you, if you start talking about the visions that I've had in my dreams and stuff, and the fact that I am a little bit susceptible to mental... Uh, <laughs> good word you know they'll be like well that's clearly just part of your mental illness Jonathan isn't it you know <laughs> what I mean and it's just a bit freaky so I so but no yeah there was periods where I was very unstable and what I would was, cause the breakdown is it literally a vision you'd gone through or would it be something in reality that had happened to I think I just always carried a weight with me you know I had some bad experiences in my childhood and in my teenage years like many people do uh, and I'd probably didn't process them well didn't really have any outlet for them and there was just stuff building up and building up and building up and uh i wasn't engaging with it and i wasn't dealing with it so there was a lot of things that weren't being dealt with and just the madness of the world that you're in as well hmm. you know it's, i think that that saying it's no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society hmm. i was always interested That's in cool. that angle on things because Let's face it, man, it's no exaggeration to say that we are members of a culture that is somewhat insane, you know. Mm. (laughs) A good song I'm listening to at the minute, but it's Alan Watts that's been cut up. But Mm. he talks about when he goes to his lectures or actually meets the other lecturers and they go for parties or meetings, they're not allowed to talk about their field. So because you can't one-up one another. Yeah. So we're actually studying mediocrity if you're not allowed to talk about it and refute one another yeah. and go for this th- th- what what we're really basing you choose to or not right? yeah we're basing intellect on mediocrity and yeah. and down in this placid base level here's what we know but we don't discuss with one another and we leave it there and that's kind of what you were talking about with society there Very as well you're basing so, yourself off of a measurement yeah through something that's ingrained and sick really absolutely man. i love that that's really interesting it is interesting me because if you're born into this culture then you know there's a lot of dross that you absorb a lot of things that aren't you that you think are you it's like when people have opinions about themselves or about something and they they speak it like a parrot just repeating a script mm. and you can be repeating 
uh, just somebody else's reality to know, or just someone else's version of reality because it sounded convincing or it's been so ingrained in you through just repetitively hearing it over and over again. Uh, it's like a form of mind control. I think that we mind control ourselves. You know? mm. And if you don't have a grasp on the nature of your mind and steer the, the course of it, yeah. then there's a lot of other forces, I'm not saying forces like spirits that possess you, but there's a lot of forces in the world that will take those reins and guide your mind and thoughts toward. Yeah, I'm sure the advertisers are almost, they've almost got that mastered now you know mm. I mean? on how to infiltrate the, the mind. Of, because they understand psychology. Man. Yeah. They understand what buttons to press and how the nature of the mind works. So they say, well, if we use this word mm. and we emphasize this color, you know, all of that and yeah. just put them on billboards everywhere, put them on adverts and that you bombard the culture with that, then everyone absorbs it. And yeah. any part of you that's unconscious or just, absorb that and just repeat it or you'll go and buy a product that you, why am I buying this thing yeah, I just seem yeah, very compelled yeah. to buy all these products you know what I mean they had boobs on it <laughs> yeah it's got tits on yeah. it mate. often the case I'll get laid go to our deepest most rooted animalistic nature this is it brother and they're get, all being get, pressed yeah. all the time man. Mm. Yeah, there's a lot of social engineers out there that know how we tick that again I'm going to press this button have you seen Adam Curtis documentaries oh I, I know that name I've definitely watched some of his stuff on YouTube documentary creator of What's he doing again? Remind me of what he's about. He's been on a lot of brands, podcasts and stuff, but one of his latest uh, documentaries was Hypernormalization. Mm. And it's like a six part, but it really long series. Yeah. Um, and he literally breaks it up from 1800s or before and then really talks about this mass hypnosis of how they've done it through commercialism, consumerism, and just built it into sight. Keep drip feeding and keep mm. putting this tick in front of you. It's only, but all it is, I'm, I'm sure what you're working with um, the mentorship and stuff, what you go into is like just having deep realizations, deep awareness around it. And then you can sort of go back into it. You don't have to completely rip yourself away from all your friends or your no, family or you connect because you see a lot of people what they do is learn about that and then completely detach yeah and live this unrealistic other yeah where you're like bring an awareness behind you understand what it is realize when you've been sucked in and then just start backing off a little bit if it feels uncomfortable that's right mate yeah if, i think that's the thing about avoiding extremes and avoiding yeah uh, you've got to empower your own mind. You've got to understand the nature of your own mind a little bit to not fall under the, those spells. And if you're like deny, it, that's like escapism. That's like mm. just avoiding like the reality of, of the. I mean, like unless you're going to be a monk and you're going to live in the mountains for the rest yeah, of your yeah. life, then you've got to deal with this. And I think it's part of our duty to undo like the shit that's been sown in this culture. You know Ooh. what I mean? We've got a lot of work like that we that. can do that can help. You know what I mean? I like that a lot. Yeah, yeah. A uh, bit of what we touched on there. Um, what's your thought on nurture nature? Mm. How much of this is ingrained into us and through real young traumatic experiences and how much of this is genetically predisposition? Mm. I've thought about that a lot. It's like that madness thing I mentioned. It's like I have a... I've questioned that, like, do I have a genetic proclivity towards these things because I've inherited it in my genes or am I just a member of a culture that's insane or, and I've had bad experiences in life that have made it happen? I'm sure it's a combination of the two. But it's like, there's some people that blame every bad situation, everything that's wrong with the world and all of the depression and all the mental problems that people face on the system. And that's an absolutely... That's a truth to a degree. Mm. And you can definitely see the roots of a lot of neurosis that's embedded in the culture because it's a pretty pretty ridiculous way to run the world, <laughs> you know. Uh, but if we got away with, so like, say we got rid of all of that, there'd still be a profound sense of existential uh, angst that people would have, I believe, mm. depending on their situation, depending on their psychology, depending on their personality type, depending on many factors. So it's definitely a combination of the two, mate. Mm. Definitely. So it's just going to always be hard to say, isn't it? It's like it's when like, you've yeah. baked a cake, it doesn't matter. If it doesn't taste good, it doesn't taste good. Yeah. If you're like, but was it the bad eggs? Was it the flour that wasn't right? What was it? Yeah. It was all in there together. And once you put it in, 
you're never going to truly it's a really know. Really good analogy that is. I it's can... just come to me now, it's but really it's because we've had this it's true. Yeah, you beautiful can't say, conversation. Was it the eggs? Was it the flour? You... Was it that little bit of yeah? Yeah, and I, I, but I do. I, we spoke before about victimhood and being a victim. Mm. And you, you'll find people in whatever way it is, if it's genetically, if it's because of your childhood, however it is, they'll find an excuse or a reason to cling on to it. Yeah. And not to say, like, you don't have to take away from the pain you've been through and the trauma yeah, it's here. It's a serious thing, man. It's I mean, real. There are, yeah. you, you, there's a reason behind it. And again, with the, the, the genetic side, if it runs through the family, it's there. But the recognition's there again. The awareness is there again. This is it. And you've got to empower yourself now and push through it. That's a really good point. So if someone's got a proclivity towards a certain mindset, a proclivity towards mental illness, let's say, because of the family like sort of thing, doesn't mean you're going to have it. It means that you have a tendency, mm. kind of, you have a tendency within yourself. You have more of a proclivity than maybe other people have towards that mindset, towards that way of being. Uh, it's up to you to steer your ship, man. You yeah. Because you've got the mind that you are occupying in a way, but you are your mind. It's all a bit mad, isn't it, when you start talking about like that. <laughs> but you, you, you do have the means to adjust the sails and to guide your own like sort of destiny. And there's no one else that's in control of that ship but you. Yeah. You know. I, I, I saw an Alan Watts today, funnily enough, but he says you're under no obligation to be who you were five minutes ago. I love that quote. Oh, dude. I posted I that on Facebook today. a few times. Mate, it was, it was stunningly good. Damn straight, But yeah. I think sometimes we exacerbate parts of that mentality of, yeah, but my dad was angry, so I'm going to be angry. Or I've seen mm. it here and here. And then you allow yourself to be out. So when it comes, you could mm. probably rationalize it, work through it, feel it, express it and let it go. Mm. But because you're telling yourself a, a story of, but they were angry, it's, it's in the family, it's in the gene. Yeah. I'm going to be It can angrier. be used as a justification. You yeah. just go forward with it. Well, that's just lazy and lame, I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, we, we know no, but it's shit. true, man. Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. it's like, it's that trigger, man. Because, because you could, I mean, especially when it's an extreme thing, because if, because if people do have really violent fathers, for instance, mm. it is likely that you will be very wounded and traumatized from that. I mean, I think it's inevitable you will be. And if you, you know, and you're going to have to go through a very powerful ordeal to unlearn that. Mm. And you don't just do that overnight, man. So, mm. so you're probably going to hurt people. Kind of like. But it's really getting to the point where if something comes up in you, you can observe it rising and be like, oh, that thing's going to come up. This feels like it could be a temper tantrum mm, mm. or anger, you know, whatever you want to call it. And, and if you can observe it, then you can keep your eye on it and go, okay, this is this is coming through me now. So maybe screaming into a pillow or something might help uh, expressing it, but it's it's observing it again, but not indulging it, but not denying it. Not like, oh, no, I'm not feeling that feeling at all. No, it's not here. And kicking it away, that's just suppressing it into the shadow again. Mm. And then it's festering in your shadow until it comes up later as worse behaviour. Because mm. it's going to find a way out, man. I don't care what you... I don't care how much you deny a part of yourself. It's going to find its way out and it's going to be unconscious then. So what I say about watching it, so I, I'm kind of giving this analogy of I can see it in front of me now, for instance. Sometimes it can come through the back door and it's not in your sight of awareness and it can just possess you immediately. And then you're like a marionette puppet <laughs> to this energy and you're just lashing out, yeah, screaming, yeah. whatever it is. And you're unconscious. You're just an automaton and this thing's come through the back door and possessed you. Mm. And this thing that I'm talking about is just a, a, a fucking aspect of you that you haven't dealt with, you know. Mm. But it's going to come through the back door a few more times until you learn to discipline your mind to, to feel it or see it rising. You need to be more Pinocchio and get rid of the strings Damn right, mate. from everybody else. That's a very deep fable for Pinocchio, man. Ooh. Some deep shit in that. But anyway, but yeah, so you got to train your mind to unlearn the shit and you can't give yourself too much of a hard time when you fuck up and don't, um, don't achieve it overnight, you know what I mean? Again, I, I'd pin it a little bit back to education because mm. it's so linear, the way we learn... Is, rubbish, here's a question what's the answer here's a question and it's just this yeah. so quick process of bomb 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 you're good you're bad but it's not how to think and no. I think what you're saying there is you, you need this ability to, to unlearn and relearn unlearn and relearn and constantly be in the moment figuring stuff out and having this sidewards very much so, lateral thing very much so Mike. and I, I yeah pro I mean it's a again it's a cool culmination of everything mm. but i think education could really 
help that process where it's been missed Massively. of getting people I, I this guy's got a book um the book of thunks and it's philosophy for children hmm. but instead of here's a question what's the answer it's here's a question what's your what could the hmm. answer be it's yeah, um yeah. what colors tuesday Oh, I like this. Oh, and you've I'm got all these kids this, thinking that way. And it's, I wish someone had asked me that. And they've kid. all got the, the, a different answer, a different perspective, yeah. and a reason behind it. And to help kids and that train them in this way that everything's valid, nothing's got a full rooted, this is the answer, mm. but there's exploration around that. And if yeah. you could do that in questioning the nonsense, it's not even a nonsensical thing, there's deepness in there. It's exploring your mind. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's exploring the way that, kind of you have a very particular angle on reality and you have a very particular personality you could do that inside then yeah, you can really start to look at things differently than yeah oh this is a response this is our feel this is yeah. start to really question yourself this a bit is it more. mate so it's like being the observer you know the whole thing yeah. about meditation or mindfulness because meditation doesn't have to just be you sat on a cushion in the in the, some half lotus position it can just be you doing the dishes or you like you're talking to your girlfriend or you just walk in to the park or in town, you can just be very mindful of the thoughts that you're having in your head. Because a lot of the time, there's that thing, you know, where you daydream and then you suddenly, you kind of snap out of your daydream and he's like, how long have I been, you know, and it's mm. been ages and you've been kind of sleeping, but you've not been asleep. Mm. I, think, I guess that's why they call it daydreaming. <laughs> and you can spend, you can spend a lot of your life kind of like that. And there's nothing wrong with daydreaming. I think it's not, it's not validated enough in a way, but you know, uh, it inc so this whole thing with meditation and mindfulness, this thing that I'm trying to impart some knowledge on to others is just a way in which you can be more present mm. with your mind mm. and the people in your life as well. Start making better choices. And being present, just being here and like actually being with the person. And when they say something to you, you don't just react with, some like automatic response it's observing all the stuff that's in you mm, that's that's real beautiful and sitting with someone uh, you know there's that uh saying if you don't know where you're going any road will take, take you there, there. Yeah, mom. do you know where you are are you carving a path out now though do you have because i'm not sure on that i don't mind having not a vision mm. but i think with business with reality it's really nice to kind of go it is here's yeah. a bit of a plan i do know what i want out of it because i can aim for that then you manifest it yes yes build yeah. toward it so uh, i did i like that elusive attitude too in my time it takes a lot of pressure away yeah where where are you on that spectrum do you know what you want now and where you're going? far more than i did definitely but that's probably just because of my experience and my age you know what i mean mm. uh yeah i mean I've only really just come around to this idea of actually doing this on a regular basis, this whole idea of mentoring, if I dare use that term, uh, just facilitating the practice where I can impart knowledge and what I've learned onto others. Uh, I've done some sessions already, and it's basically like an open discussion thing. It's kind of based, I mean, it's very flexible what I do, but I'll always end a session with some form of meditation. But I can describe my experience with what mindfulness is. I, I can get into the neuroscience behind it all as well. Mm. You know, because what happens to the brain when you meditate on a regular basis is fucking extraordinary, man. Mm. It's, like, it's like the brain starts to rewire itself and it becomes a lot more plastic and a lot more flexible. Because a lot of the things that we have, the thoughts and the habits, that it's like the neural pathways in our brains literally form from, from our thoughts and our, and our actions. So if you, it's like when you're practicing an instrument and suddenly you're just getting it right every time without mm. even having to consciously think about it. It's like, A, it's muscle memory because you've got all these nervous like, systems that send signals from the brain that just do it. It's mm. like breathing, you know. But you've literally created new neural pathways in your brain and these synapses fire down it. I think this is the correct uh, terminology. So everything that you think and everything you do on a regular basis will f literally form your reality, and which really kind of comes from your brain cognition right mm. so you can unlearn the things yeah. that aren't working for you and rewire your brain it's literally science but it's also you can get into the mystical stuff at the same time if, if you'd like to if you want to so yeah. so if i get a client if i dare use that term just another human being that wants to jam yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or a, like a group of people i'll i'll kind of read the room find out what the people are like and we'll just chat 
And then if they seem to be into the mysticism stuff, then I'll then I'll I'll spend more time like emphasizing some of the mythology and some of the like mystical stuff. But if mm. but if people just want to learn how to handle their mental illness, then I'll just go into the neuroscience and all that. Mate, that's, I um, I back yourself because when you I think you are just having a jam with them. Yeah, mate. Clients are stupid term. Isn't it? It, it's a, yeah, but I I think there's a an element of you that. You, you don't want to use that terminology and so on, but there's probably the people that need it want you to talk in a certain jargon to start with. Do you know what I mean? It's probably my prejudice against the word, Mikey. I'm, I'm, it I've probably got, shows my limitation. I've got a friend who, who's a counsellor, uh, been a counsellor in Derby for 25, 30 years. I love him to... Uh, David Eames, big fella. Mm. You'll know he's a big fella. <laughs> I do another podcast with him now called On Your Mind with David Eames. Oh, nice. And again, he holds this kind of grace about him. He's, he'll still use the my clients and that. that he'll speak in the professional, yeah. quote unquote, world. But then behind the scenes and all that, you've got you here. Mm. But I, I just, that's only my piece of thought towards what yeah. you're doing because you clearly know your stuff. You you're an amazing human, but I'd probably back yourself <laughs> yeah. some. Do you know what I mean? When yeah, when I hear your reluctance to say certain things, I'm like, I think use that professional lingo sometimes. It'll I think make I could. you feel and sound a little bit. That part of me is it's like I'm too I'm too like I'm too much of a counterculture hipster to nah, do that. But- it was, then, a, it was an, a random tangent, but just something that strikes me somewhere. That's I'm a just good fe- thing. I'm feeling it, and I'm like, I think back it. And I, watching that side of myself, Mikey, mm. there's definitely those aspects of myself where I was like, ah, that's, you know, I'm just like, eh. Mate, we about, need... Just about a word, do you know what I mean? We, we, it's we, just we, a word. We need we need those friends in our life where you go, hang on a minute, let's check us here. Because yeah. I, I was always so self-deprecating and just like never backing myself. But mm. then when I'd go towards doing, I've got keynote on Friday, I'd be in this imposter syndrome, this doubt feeling. Yeah, mate. It's not a good place. I and mean, yeah. My, my friend Martin, he just said, it's because every time you're talking about yourself, you think you're shit. <laughs> like everything you're saying mm. about yourself is just trying to hide something. Yeah. You're really good. You're good at it. There's yeah. people that gravitate to them words. There's people that, especially kids, that hang on to what you're saying go in with that attitude and as soon as I did yeah. for a session it was like oh, I belong here this, this is, is it good. and I think you, yeah fake it till you make it kind of feel so yeah of course man. just something in there so, somewhere surely <laughs> so it felt authentic when you went into the situation with that with that mindset to not kind of shy away from doing that yeah because a part of it, like it can be fun having a bit of self-deprecating attitude behind you and just mm. taking a piss and that there's little elements there but it can't be every part of you. Can't be, mate. I, I strike a balance, don't you? Yeah. You know so I, mean? I think that that was yeah. just something I noticed in that. And no, I, it's good. It's good. I really appreciate like just the authenticity I, of speech. I feel for me and you I mean? when we listen to this back, there'll be this part of the conversation where we listen to "Hello" as in the future. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Johnny we, and Mikey. Yeah. <laughs> in seven years, we won't even have the same molecular structure. Oh my Do god! You know I mean, Look, Apparently, according keep, to all the great keep hold scientists, of this. Keep hold of it's this. It's all going to dissolve. Oh, it's no. all temporal. It's all fleeting. We are going to dissolve. We're basically just sun's going to crash into the earth. Decaying and... meek sacks. That's all <laughs> yeah. you are, Mikey. My in the flesh future. vessel. Remember is... that. Yeah. You dirty pig. <laughs> <laughs> you dirty piece of perverse flesh. Look at you, <laughs> dude. Sinners in flesh vessels. Let. Jabbering on. Go Let's on. call this our first episode. But honestly, love it. I think we could do hundreds of these. I really do. I I, I wanted to get an idea of what you're doing, the trajectory you are on, where you're going. Mm. But I think we could go back to so many timelines and talk about <sighs> the, the anecdotal, okay, Johnny is a kid, mm. Johnny in the party scene, and Johnny in the music. We, we could go all in. The LSD, the DMT, Dude. The, the fucking Egyptian pyramids. But, mate, we're not even <laughs> We didn't even touch on Egypt, Egypt mate. Crazy. But honestly, but, yeah. I, I, want, I want that podcast alone with you. On all those different Let's side it, notes. Let's Are you up it, for that? Definitely, Mike. Mate, and the offers out, I, I would happily give you some free time to help you set up a podcast. Because I, lo- I love I love, what, for it, I love what you're doing. And I think you're one of them people I listen to, I talk to, and I go, I, I would be a, a listener, a regular listener. Yeah, I'd mate. love to see what you're doing. 
still trying to climb up a few of those little rungs in personality that I'm still trying to dissolve into my higher self, as they say. Mm. Mate, it's a, it's a beautiful self. Yes, brother. I'm happy I get to meet it and be around it. Uh, guys, so where can people find out some of your stuff if they listen to this and gone, mm. hmm, he's mis- mystique, he's a <laughs> 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 mystical, magic, wild man, and I'd really like to talk to him. Where would they go to find that? You can just look me up on Face Crack. Facebook, <laughs> Facebook. Uh, I actually set up a page last night because I was like, I've got to do some, because I'm thinking of a website. I've got to get my brother and a few other people that are technical wizards to do a website for mm. me. And that's just in its embryonic stage. I've not done it yet, but I'll do it. But for now, just go to John Swino, Zen. Shit, what was it again? I think John, 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 John Swino. I set it up last night. John Johnny Swino, Swino, Zen Mentor. Yes. That's my new Facebook account that's purely for this thing yes. that I've just been talking to Mikey about. And then you've got Johnny Swino, S-W-I-N-H-O-E for the surname. That's just my personal account. So you can look me up on either or both, or you can email me on johnswino at yahoo.com also. I'll put the links in. Uh, chuck us a line, uh, or just add me, or whatever. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. blah You're blah, beautiful. Blah. I do my bit. Guys, you've been a part of the Old Farm Bus, Back of the Bus Sessions podcast. I'm going to leave you on this, and I always do, and I always will. Just be nice to one another, you beautiful set of buggers. That's all you got to do. Be nice. He says it. Be nice. Be nice. (laughs) You dirty pigs. (laughs) 